Hi folks, so we're looking at doing incident response and investigation of a system that is currently offline, so dead system analysis, as opposed to live system analysis where we're investigating a machine that is currently running. And we're going to talk about some of the approaches of doing offline analysis and why you might choose to do so. This video is going to be quite short because I'm signposting a number of techniques and um, topics that have been covered elsewhere. So a lot of the topics that we've already covered on incident response applies equally when the system's offline and this, this topic ties in really closely to a lot of digital forensics topics as well. So I'm just going to signpost and talk about the reasoning uh, behind the decision making. So the first question is why do offline analysis? So whatever uh, an attacker is doing or malware is doing, if you have an active entity on your machine that's doing things, some software running that is, you know, your computer's compromised and it's taking actions, um, under the influence of, of an external attacker, then by turning the computer off, you stop them from being able to take further actions. So that is going to help to protect the integrity and confidentiality of our own data that we have on the system. And it's going to also help protect the digital evidence that we have and our ability to investigate what's happened. Um, so for example, if log files are being altered or timestamps are being changed, uh, in, in log files, but also in uh, the metadata attached to files. If an attacker is doing those things, by turning the computer off, then we stop them from making those kinds of changes that will make it harder for us to see what's happened. And as we discussed at length in the live analysis topic, there is a lot of reasons to be suspicious of a computer that you think may have been compromised, because if there are um, rootkits, trojanized software on that machine, it means that the software might be lying to you about the state of the computer. So obviously if you turn the computer off and just pull the hard drive out, you can look at it without having to worry about whether the software is telling you the truth about what's happening. Uh, except in the, uh, you know, if you plug a hard drive in, then unless the firmware of the hard drive is lying, which is very rare, although there is isn't, there is at least one instance where that's been um, shown to have happened in the past by the equation group, um, allegedly the, the NSA. Um, but, you know, typically when you pull the hard drive out and you plug it into a machine, you can be um, certain that you're looking at the actual, you know, what's stored on the disk. So, so we've discovered and, you know, detected a security incident and we've taken it offline, what do we do? So we're going to talk about how you acquire and analyze that evidence while um, minimizing the potential to compromise the evidence that you've collected. So the first thing you need to do is actually acquire the evidence um, by either creating a disk image or just pulling the hard drive out and plugging it into a computer. So if you take what's on a hard drive and create an image of that, that can either be done by using a system utility like DD to copy it byte for byte what's on the disk and store it in a file or, or on another disk um, is also possible. Um, or you can use forensic software that will create a image for you um, and it is not just byte for byte what was on the disk, but it includes extra information. Um, it, for example, it will typically include hashes. So while it's collecting the evidence, it generates hashes so that you can verify the integrity of that evidence later. Um, and that is particularly helpful if you're going to leave that hard drive not plugged in so that you can then see that, yeah, the hard drive matches what you're um, collecting if you're planning to put that hard drive back into production later, then you know it, uh, there's less less of a benefit on that specific role. But you know, um, it does provide the confidence that your you know data's not been corrupted as well. So 
yeah, so those are, those are some of the options. You can literally just plug a hard drive in to another computer and investigate it that way. Um, and depending on the importance of preserving the evidence for legal action later, then that might also influence your decision making. Uh, a lot of this decision making should have already been done before the security incidents happened as part of your planning for incident response. So if you are going to plug a hard drive into a computer, and that is whether you're doing it to just look at what's on the, the um, just to poke around at what's on the hard drive, or in order to create that image that you're going to create, you can use a write blocker. And a write blocker is just a little piece of hardware that um, typically sits between the hard drive and the computer. Um, there's also software-based solutions. Uh, but basically, it will allow you to read from the hard drive, but it will stop write instructions from reaching the hard drive. So it will provides quite a lot of confidence that your um, you know, evidence or that the hard drive is not going to be accidentally written to as part of your investigation. So if you are a digital forensics investigator, this will be part of your standard toolkit. You'll have write blockers on hand. If you are a like cyber security professional, you may or may not have them um, available, but you might plan to make them available as part of the toolkit that you have within the organization for dealing with um, incidents. They're not expensive. You can buy a write blocker for like 20 pounds or something. So, you know, you, they're, they're quite reasonable nowadays. You, it's not, not a big expense. It's just planning for it to make sure it's available because a lot of organizations won't have them, you know, around unless you specifically plan to make that part of your incident response plan and purchase it in advance so that you've got it on hand for when you need it. So depending on an organization size, um, there's a, well, there's a pretty good chance that most organizations won't have write blockers uh, lying around um, unless the security team has specifically decided to have that as part of their incident response, in which case you can procure it. Um, it's not particularly expensive. Um, you just need to order it. So <clears throat> if you do decide to plug a computer in directly to access it directly, um, you should mount it as read-only. Um, you can do that with or without a, write, a physical hardware write blocker. Like if you just mount it read-only, that is essentially a software-based solution where the kernel tries to, or the kernel should, shouldn't write to the disk, only read from the disk. Um, but there's still, you know, some risk that something might get written where, it, so if you combine that with a hardware, solution then you can be very confident that the you know the disk's not been altered at all. Um, so if you do plug a hard drive into a computer and you mount it read only, then you can then just directly access using the standard system tools, um, all the programs that you've got installed on that computer to look through all the files that was on the compromised machine. Um, it's good for kind of non-forensics people, like cyber security people that are used to doing having command line available, all of the tools, the same tool sets you can apply. You can basically fire up Rootkit Hunter or Sharsum to check for hashes, anti-malware software to run against the files on there. It's all fairly straightforward. Um, but the, the disadvantage is that there's some risk that you accidentally end up compromising the machine you're doing investigation from. So, you know, if you, ac if you run some executable program that's on a machine that has been infected with malware, there's a good chance you'll end up infecting your investigating machine. Um, and just all the data that's on that machine could have all sorts of dodgy things that, um, you know, if your analysis software has or just the programs that you're you're opening your images with are vulnerable to JPEG based attack. You know, your computer can be attacked from loading up an image, for example. Um, so, you know, the likelihood of that, you know, 
I guess is, um, you know, you might decide that it, on on balance is worth the um, the risk, and you can do things to protect yourself by using an investigation machine, using sandbox, you know, using sandboxes or virtual machines to kind of isolate the damage that can happen if there was some, you know, compromise there. Um, but it's just something that you should be aware of. The alternative is to use forensics tools um, like specialist software like Encase or Autopsy to do your investigation and they can either load a, a hard drive or a disk image and when you're using that software it will give you a way of viewing what's there and it give you all sorts of tools and techniques um, and automated approaches and hex views of you know being able to browse through the, the data and pull out the things that are interesting from a forensics perspective um, while maintaining the integrity of the evidence and um, you, you know you can use hash sets to do things like um, find things that are known to be um, problem problematic or to just filter out known files so you can generate your own hash set of well this is what I would expect to see on the system and then if you feed that into the forensic software and it will show you the things that don't match those hashes so you know there's there's a number of pros and cons there essentially you know it will give you tools to look at things like JPEG images uh, but there might not be tools to you know look at other kind of more um, less known file formats and things uh, that you might be able to access at the command line and if you are a command line wizard then you know you don't have all those tools available to you um, there might not be the same kind of anti-malware stuff built in um, so if you're looking if you think your computer has been infected it might not make it that easy to actually um, look for malware um, what you can do is combine those two approaches so you know there's nothing to stop you from mounting the the disk to do some of your investigation and using forensic software to use to do other parts of your investigation so th there's a lot of topics that we've already covered that you could then apply um, but also if you're if you're studying digital forensics there's a number of techniques there that that apply in this scenario as well um, so if you're familiar with Encase, FTK or um, you know Autopsy there's, there's a number of there's all sorts of features built into that software that you can use and a lot of it is kind of targeted at forensic investigations uh, and so a lot of that is kind of around investigating like crimes that may have happened and um, you know gathering information about that um, it, it might they're not as geared towards for example looking for malware on a machine um, but they're, they're closely related um, and the tools can certainly be used to um, as part of an incident response so some of the analysis techniques that you will likely use will be to do the integrity checking and log analysis so checking what files have changed looking through log files to see what's happened on the computer doing file type analysis which can pull out files of specific types that will be of interest to you so if you are doing you know if you're investigating a crime that is to do with um, like for inappropriate photographs you're looking at JPEG images or something but in this case if you're investigating an incident that's happened um, where a system may have been compromised probably the most interesting thing to you is the binary files or executable files and so you can use those say like those uh, forensics tools to say well show me all of the executable files and then and then like well which of those match what we would have expected to be say, running on that system and then if they don't match then we can investigate that further um, you know and there's all those other things we talked about in the integrity um, topic so using file uh, like package management to check for files that have been installed by package managers that have changed looking at hash sets and the rest of it 
Um, there's um, timeline based analysis. So timeline analysis is a really powerful technique. And <clears throat> the one of the things you can do is build a timeline based on the metadata attached to all the files on your file system. So each file in your file system has um, the date that the file was most recently changed and the date that it was most rec recently accessed. And on Unix, it has the when the inode last changed and on Windows, the creation date. So you can use that information to build a timeline of kind of what's happened on the system. The gaps you'll get is it won't be able to tell you when a, like if you open file A and then B and then A again, it will just show you B and then A because it just shows you the last time that these things happened. But that still can give you a very good view of what led to an incident. Um, but the more time that's passed, the less, I guess, accurate the picture is if you're looking far into the past. The things that have happened recently, it can show you quite accurately like the, 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 um, um, the steps or the order that things have happened in um, right at the end, like that's you know, followed a compromise, for example, the things that have been accessed after a system has been compromised. But um, similar to when we were talking about all the caveats with live system analysis, this is just information stored on the disk. And if an attacker ended up with root access on your machine, then they can change all of this stuff. So they can change the metadata attached to all the files, including changing the timestamps attached to all those files. So they can, they could like wipe, uh, basically just erase the access times, or they can actually just create a completely false picture of what's happened by uh, modifying the access times. Um, so, you know, while it's healthy to be a little bit paranoid about that, um, the vast majority of the time, the timeline analysis won't have been altered. So it is usually a, a good thing to look at. Um, the other thing you can do is look at deleted files. So you, as you will know from digital forensics topics, when you delete a file off a um, standard hard drive, the file usually stays on disk until it actually gets overwritten later. It just basically gets removed from the index that says what files are on the disk, stored on the disk. So even if an attacker deletes some files, uh, you might find you know the scripts they were running and things like that stored on the hard drive if you if you look for them. So some software you might want to use is like Autopsy. It's a free and open source forensic toolkit. Uh, it's a front end for SleuthKit, um, which is a set of command line tools, which can also be um, you know useful to learn about. And there's a web-based learn um, version of Autopsy that's uh, that's included in in Kai Linux, and then so therefore it will be used quite a lot by people that are using Kali a lot. Uh, but actually, there's a newer desktop version that is possible to get running on Linux, but not easy. That's a bit of a faff. Um, but that runs on Windows, um, so you know that's also a, a, an option. Helix Incident Response is also a, um, a good toolkit that you can use um, and there's, they have some online and offline kind of um, features you can use to do investigations. So in conclusion, uh, incident response can include dead offline analysis, um, which ties into a lot of the techniques that we've already covered, um, but also the techniques used by forensic investigators. The goals are a bit different because in our case we're talking about on it within an organization, um, the investigating your systems that may have been compromised within an organization as opposed to as part of a digital forensic investigation. Um, but there's, there's a lot of overlap there. So the things that you've learned about how to use these tools to do forensic investigations, a lot of them can be applied to do incident response, particularly the offline analysis part. And there are a number of specialist tools uh, that are available for doing that. And a lot, a lot of the techniques that we've covered um, previously, like incident response and, um, you know, about log file analysis and 
um, you know, other topics, you, you can apply them when you're looking at this information to try and understand what's happened.